Once upon a time in ancient Greece where legendary stories were born, there was a family known for producing heroes. It all started with Perseus, the hero who defeated the scary Medusa. He married Andromeda, a brave princess he rescued from a sea monster. Together they founded a great city called Mycenae, where Perseus became the first king. This royal family grew and had seven sons, Perses, Electrion, Alcaeus, Sthenelus, Helios, Mestor, and two daughters, Otakthi and Gorgophone. Little did they know that one of their descendants would become one of Greece's mightiest heroes, Heracles. But before Heracles, we must first understand the circumstances prior to his birth. Among Perseus's descendants, Electrion became the king of Mycenae. He ruled honorably and had many sons, but a terrible war with King Pteraleus's children brought tragedy, and Electrion lost all his male heirs. At the same time, Alcaeus, a relative of Electrion, became the ruler of Tyrans and had a son named Amphitryon. Amphitryon was a brave and noble man and was deeply in love with Alcmene, who was Electrion's daughter. He set off on a journey to Mycenae with gifts and hopes of marrying her, but the fates can sometimes be unkind. As Amphitryon and Electrion were overlooking the cattle, one of the animals attempted to break loose from its compound. Amphitryon threw his club at the animal in an attempt to stop it. However, the club rebounded off the corns of the cattle and struck Electrion on the head. And in that moment, Amphitryon unintentionally caused the death of his future father-in-law, Electrion. Electrion's death cast a dark shadow over Mycenae. His nephew, Sthenelus, saw an opportunity to take the throne. He blamed Amphitryon for Electrion's death. Sthenelus accused him of murder and casted a cloud of suspicion over the young couple. As a result, Amphitryon and Alcmene, innocent of the crime, were unfairly banished from Mycenae. They sought refuge and a fresh start in the welcoming city of Thebes. Despite their deep love, Amphitryon and Alcmene faced big challenges. Alcmene vowed not to marry Amphitryon until her brother's deaths were avenged, just like her father intended. Her determination never wavered, even when faced with divine forces. Amphitryon, driven by his love for Alcmene and his desire to unite their lives, took a solemn oath to seek vengeance. However, Amphitryon did not have an army, like Electrion, so he sought help from Creon, the ruler of Thebes. Creon agreed to Amphitryon's request, under the condition that they got rid of the Tumesian fox that was ravaging the kingdom. Naturally, Amphitryon agreed, and with that, they set for war. While Amphitryon was away, Zeus, the king of all gods, couldn't resist Alcmene's beauty. He hatched a clever plan to be with her. Zeus, who could change his appearance, transformed into Amphitryon. Not only did he look like Amphitryon, but he also knew everything about him, even the ongoing war. Zeus, now looking like Amphitryon, approached Alcmene. Still heartbroken and longing for her love, she was completely fooled by his disguise. That night, thinking she was with Amphitryon, they shared a special moment. Little did she know that this would change her life forever as she became pregnant with Zeus's child. The real Amphitryon returned to Thebes the next day, unaware of the events that had happened while he was away. When he saw Alcmene, he was puzzled by her unsurprised reaction. He was completely unaware of the divine trickery that had taken place, but did not question her. That night, Amphitryon and Alcmene also laid together. Alcmene also became pregnant by Amphitryon. As Amphitryon's confusion grew each day, he desperately sought answers. He decided to visit the Oracle of Delphi, a sacred place known for its wisdom. He hoped to unravel the mystery that had taken over his life. At the Oracle of Delphi, the Pythia, the chosen priestess of Apollo, revealed the shocking truth about Zeus's visit to Alcmene. The divine deception was exposed and Amphitryon was left wondering about his role in these extraordinary events. As Alcmene's pregnancy advanced, Zeus made a hasty proclamation that sent shockwaves through both the divine and mortal worlds. The king of the gods declared that the child born the next day, a descendant of Perseus, would one day rule Mycenae. Zeus's promise did not escape the notice of his wife Hera, the queen of the gods. 
Consumed by a dangerous mix of jealousy and anger, she couldn't stand the idea of Zeus fathering a mortal child who was destined for greatness. Determined to stop Zeus's proclamation, Hera devised a plan to prevent Alcmene from giving birth on the fateful day. The day of Alcmene's delivery arrived, and Hera, determined to execute her plan, descended upon Thebes. She confronted Elithea, the goddess of childbirth, and ordered her to stop the birth from happening at any cost. Elithea, in a stubborn act of divine obstinacy, sat down on Alcmene and blocked the birthing process. As Elithea remained stubborn, Hera came up with another scheme. She turned her attention to Nisipe, the pregnant wife of King Sthenelus of Mycenae, who wasn't due to give birth for several weeks. Hera's wicked intervention sped up Nisipe's labor, furthering her twisted plan. Hera had no intention of letting Heracles be born. However, Galinthius, a loyal handmaiden and close friend of Alcmene, witnessed Hera's meddling. Out of unwavering loyalty and love for her mistress, she came up with a clever trick. Galinthius shouted, A son is born! This cunning deception fooled Elithia, who believed her duty was done, and she uncrossed her legs. Taking advantage of the moment created by Galinthius's quick thinking, Alcmene gave birth to her child, Heracles. Originally, he was named Alcides, but in an attempt to appease Hera, Alcmene changed his name to Heracles, which meant, for the glory of Hera. In addition, something unexpected happened. The following day, Alcmene gave birth to another son, named Iphicles. Elithia, however, was furious at Galinthius, and in her rage, she transformed Galinthius into a polecat. Despite the intervention of Galinthius, Nitipi still gave birth to a son first, due to Hera and Elithia's intervention. Zeus could not go back on his word, and so it was Eurystheus, the son of Sthenelus, who was destined to become the future king of Mycenae. Zeus then plotted himself, and he bargained with his own wife, getting Hera to agree that if Heracles successfully completed a series of epic adventures, then he would become one of the immortals of Mount Olympus. Hera agreed, for it left her plenty of time to kill the illegitimate son of Zeus. Surprisingly, it was not Hera who first threatened the life of Heracles. Alcmene was so worried about the anger of Hera that she abandoned the newborn Heracles in a Theban field, presuming that he would die from exposure. Athena, the goddess of wisdom and strategy, watched with a mixture of kindness and worry as the chaos surrounding Heracles' birth unfolded. She cared for him and wanted to protect him, so she whisked the newborn Heracles away to Mount Olympus, where he'd be safe. Athena decided to have fun with her stepmother Hera. She told Hera of her rescuing an unidentified baby, and the motherly instincts of Hera kicked in. Hera took the baby to nurse him, unaware of just who she was nursing. Heracles would suck so hard on the teat of Hera that the goddess was forced to push the baby away, causing the milk of the goddess to be released, spraying out into the heavens and creating the Milky Way. However, baby Heracles had consumed enough nourishment from the goddess to give him strength and power beyond that of any normal mortal, and Athena would then return her half-brother to the care of Alcmene and Amphitryon. Hera watched Heracles and Iphicles, but she was not sure which of the children was the child of Zeus. At just eight months old, Heracles faced his first big challenge. Hera sent two deadly snakes into their bedroom. When Iphicles saw the serpents, he cried out, causing the servant who acted as Heracles and Iphicles' nurse to come running. The nurse, though, encountered no danger for the baby Heracles had already killed the two snakes, strangling one in each hand. Hera then knew that Heracles was the one that would receive her wrath. As Heracles continued to grow, many mentors recognized his extraordinary potential. His father, Amphitryon, taught him about honor and courage. He learned wrestling from Autolycus, archery from Eurytus, fencing from Castor, and boxing from Harpolycus of Phenote. He even studied literature, music, and the lyre with teachers like Linus and Eumolpus. In the early years of Heracles' extraordinary life, adventure seemed to find him at every turn. His journey of heroism began when he was just 18 years old, and it started with an incredible feat, the slaying of the fearsome lion of Shitharan. This lion was a true specimen of power and virility. It had been terrorizing the land, preying upon the flocks of two different kings, 
Amphitryon, and Thespius. Heracles was on a mission to end this menace once and for all. For fifty relentless days, Heracles pursued the lion through the rugged terrain of Mount Citheron. Day after day, he tracked the beast, his determination unwavering. Finally, in a fierce battle, Heracles emerged victorious. The lion was no match for his strength and courage, but Heracles didn't stop there. In a remarkable display of resourcefulness, he skinned the lion and fashioned its hide into a fearsome helmet. From that day forward, he proudly wore the lion's scalp as a symbol of his triumph. Heracles' incredible power and deeds had already gained him a reputation that extended far and wide. Amazed by the young hero's prowess and determination, King Thespius of Thespiae was not only impressed, but also had a rather unusual wish. He desired that all of his fifty daughters have children by Heracles. So night after night, King Thespius devised a plan. He discreetly sent each of his fifty daughters to Heracles' bed, one by one. Heracles, thinking he was sharing his bed with the same woman, unknowingly fulfilled the king's wish. He was a hero in more ways than one, as he fathered at least one child with each of the fifty daughters. Heracles' journey was far from over, and his encounters with adversaries continued. After his triumphant lion-slaying adventure, he found himself face to face with the heralds of Virginus, the Minion King. Their mission was to collect the annual tribute from Thebes, a tribute of 100 cows. Heracles, never one to back down from a challenge, responded to their demands with audacity. He didn't just refuse to hand over the tribute, instead, he took matters into his own hands. With a bold move, he cut off their ears, noses, and hands. Then he fastened them by ropes from their necks and instructed them to carry this gruesome tribute back to Erginus and the minions. This act of defiance infuriated Erginus, who gathered his minion army and marched towards Thebes seeking vengeance. However, it was a grave mistake. In a battle of might and heroism, Heracles once again emerged victorious. He not only defeated Erginus, but also compelled the minions to pay double the original tribute to the Thebans. In the wake of a mighty triumph against the minions, Heracles returned to Thebes, his name celebrated throughout Greece. It was a time of joy, for Creon, touched by the hero's valor, offered him a precious reward. He presented Heracles with a gift beyond measure, the hand of his eldest daughter, Megara, in marriage. Heracles and Megara's love story blossomed, like the sweetest of tales. Their union brought forth the laughter of children. Their family was a beacon of happiness. Within the walls of their home, Heracles found solace and serenity, and it seemed as though he had found the haven he had long sought. However, trouble brewed in Greece, and it was in Heracles' absence that chaos descended upon Thebes. Lycus, a cruel usurper from Euboea, sought to grasp power for himself. In his ruthless bid for dominion, he dared the unthinkable. He murdered Creon, the noble father of Megara. When Heracles returned to Thebes expecting the warmth of homecoming, he was greeted by a chilling scene of turmoil and despair. News of Creon's murder struck him like a thunderbolt. Worse still, Lycus stood on the precipice of committing an unspeakable atrocity, the slaughter of Megara and their innocent children. With the swiftness of a lion, Heracles leaped into action, his heart ablaze with fury and love. He raced to defend his beloved family, confronting Lycus with a righteous wrath. A single arrow ended Lycus's reign of terror, securing the safety of those he cherished most. However, fate, it seemed, had a crueler destiny in mind. Just as Heracles prepared to offer a sacrifice to Zeus, the king of gods, a shadow fell upon his heart. Hera, the relentless adversary of Heracles, could not resist the temptation to sow discord. In a malevolent twist, she cast a spell upon him, plunging Heracles into a maddening abyss of delusion and unchecked rage. In this frenzied madness, Heracles committed an act so ghastly that it would haunt his nightmares for eternity. Hera made him believe the innocent children before him were not his own, but the sons of his arch-nemesis, Eurystheus. Blinded by madness, he drew his bow and unleashed a storm of arrows upon his own offspring. Only when he stood poised to slay his own adopted father, Amphitryon, Believing him to be Eurystheus's kin, did Athena intervene. With a swift blow, she sent Heracles into a deep slumber, sparing further bloodshed. Megara lay lifeless beside their slain children. 
Consumed by guilt and grief, he believed his very existence was a curse upon those he loved most. Desperation gripped Heracles, and he contemplated the darkest of fates, ending his own life to escape the torment of his actions. It was then that his loyal friend Theseus arrived at his side. Theseus, steadfast in his friendship and armed with wisdom, implored Heracles not to surrender to despair. In time, Heracles arrived at a solemn decision, a journey of redemption for the unspeakable crime he had committed. It was a quest to find a way to cleanse his tormented soul and to seek forgiveness from the gods. Yet, even in his exile, a glimmer of hope emerged. Heracles recalled the Oracle of Delphi, a source of divine guidance. The Oracle's words resonated in his mind. To find redemption, he must serve King Eurystheus of Tyrans for twelve grueling years, completing any task the king set before him. The promise was tantalizing. If he succeeded and served his sentence in full, he would ascend to immortality. And so, Heracles set forth on a new path, one filled with trials that would test his mettle, courage, and resolve. These tasks became known as the Twelve Labors of Heracles, his quest to prove his worth to the gods and erase the stain of his past. Eurystheus, a favored king of Hera, took perverse delight in assigning seemingly insurmountable tasks to Heracles. The first of these labors was the slaying of the Nemean lion, a fearsome creature with bronze claws and invulnerable skin, terrorizing the land between Nemea and Mycenae. Heracles soon discovered that his arrows were futile against this monstrosity. Undeterred, he employed his immense strength and cunning. Cornering the lion in its own cave, he strangled the beast, claiming victory. Yet, returning to Tyrans with the lion's impervious hide draped over his shoulders proved too much for Eurystheus. The king cowered within a massive jar, and Heracles was forbidden from entering the city. Eurystheus, unsatisfied by Heracles' triumph over the Nemean lion, devised an even deadlier challenge, the Lernaean Hydra. This aquatic monster guarded an entrance to the underworld and possessed multiple regenerating heads. With each severed head, two more grew in its place, a true testament to its nightmarish nature. Guided by the wisdom of Athena and aided by his nephew Iolaus, Heracles waged a fierce battle. Employing a strategy to sear the wounds, preventing new heads from sprouting, he overcame the insidious Hydra. Yet, Eurystheus discounted this labor arguing that Heracles had received assistance. Heracles' next challenge was to capture the Cyrenian Hind, a creature of grace and beauty with golden antlers sacred to Artemis, the goddess of the hunt. The Hind roamed the forests freely, and capturing it required not just strength, but also cunning. For an entire year, Heracles pursued the elusive Hind through dense woods and across rolling hills. The creature was swift and cunning, leading him on a tireless chase. Finally, he cornered the hind, and with words as smooth as honey, he spoke to Artemis. He promised that he meant no harm to the sacred creature and would release it once his labor was complete. Artemis, moved by his sincerity, agreed to Heracles' plea. She took back her cherished hind, which disappeared gracefully into the woods. Heracles had once again used his wits, not just his incredible strength, to achieve victory. As Heracles continued his heroic journey, Eurystheus grew more desperate to find tasks that might prove fatal to the hero. For his fourth labor, Heracles faced the Aramanthian boar, a monstrous creature terrorizing the region of Sophus. With his unrivaled hunting skills, Heracles tracked the boar to its lair, but capturing it required more than just bravery. He used the environment to his advantage, driving the boar into deep snow where its movements were hindered. With great skill and determination, he managed to subdue the fearsome beast. Returning to Tyrans with the Aramanthian boar slung over his mighty shoulders, Heracles' triumph struck terror into Eurystheus' heart. The king, fearing for his life, hid inside a large wine jar for three long days. Finally, Heracles released the captured boar, which swam away to the distant shores of Italy. Eurystheus, vexed by Heracles' continued success, devised a labor that aimed to humiliate the hero. He ordered Heracles to clean the Aegean stables, which housed an astonishing 3,000 cattle and had not been cleaned for three decades. The filth and dung had accumulated to an unimaginable level. Rather than succumbing to shame, 
Heracles chose a clever approach. He diverted the course of two mighty rivers, the Aphius and Peneus, channeling their powerful waters through the Aegean stables. In a torrential rush, the rivers washed away the mountains of dung and filth. Heracles had completed the task with ingenuity and efficiency. However, he demanded payment from King Aegeus for his labor, as promised earlier. This audacious request for payment angered Eurystheus, who, refusing to acknowledge the achievement, dismissed the labor. For his sixth labor, Heracles ventured to the region surrounding Lake Stymphalia, where a terrifying menace plagued the land. Man-eating birds, the Stymphalian birds, armed with bronze beaks and feathers that served as deadly projectiles, terrorized the inhabitants. This labor required not only strength but also the guidance of the goddess Athena, who provided Heracles with a remarkable bronze noisemaker crafted by Hephaestus. When shaken, this contraption emitted a deafening sound, sending the birds into a frenzied flight. With Athena's assistance and the thunderous noise, Heracles cleared the skies of these monstrous birds. Many fell to his arrows, while others fled to the distant island of Aretius, where they would later encounter the legendary Argonauts. On the island of Crete, Heracles confronted the menacing Cretan bull. King Minos had once neglected to sacrifice this beast to Poseidon, allowing it to ravage the land unchecked. Heracles captured the bull with his immense strength and presented it in Tiryns. However, the labor took an unexpected twist. Hera, ever the adversary of Heracles, refused to accept the sacrifice. As a result, the bull was released and wandered to the plains of Marathon, where it would encounter the legendary hero Theseus in the future. In the eighth labor, Heracles found himself in the untamed lands of Thrace, facing a gruesome challenge, the notorious man-eating mares of King Diomedes. These vicious steeds were no ordinary horses. Their insatiable hunger for human flesh had earned them a fearsome reputation. Undeterred by the deadly nature of this task, Heracles confronted King Diomedes, a cruel ruler who reveled in the savagery of his monstrous horses. In a clash of strength and wits, Heracles defeated Diomedes, and in a twist of fate that mirrored the king's own cruelty, he fed the tyrant to his own ravenous steeds. With their master turned into a macabre meal, the mares underwent a remarkable transformation. The taste of human flesh, which had once driven them to madness, was now satisfied. These once ferocious creatures became docile and tame, a testament to Heracles' unmatched prowess and his ability to turn chaos into order. News of a legendary prize reached the ears of Eurystheus, the magnificent girdle of Hippolyta, queen of the fierce Amazons. This belt, a symbol of power and authority, stirred the king's greed. He demanded that Heracles undertake the perilous task of stealing it, believing that the girdle would adorn his own daughter or be the instrument of Heracles' downfall at the hands of the formidable Amazon warriors. The task unfolded in a manner both tragic and ironic. As Heracles embarked on his mission with his cousin Theseus, he discovered that Queen Hippolyta was not only willing to part with her prized possession, but welcomed the heroes as guests. She was particularly fond of Theseus, and the two fell deeply in love. She willingly chose to leave her people behind and wed Theseus in Athens. The Amazon warriors were outraged at this act and misunderstood the situation, believing that Hippolyta had been violently abducted. This resulted with the Amazons waging war against Athens, igniting the Attic War. During these events, Hippolyta met her untimely end at the hands of her own sister, Penthesilea, whose spear inadvertently ended the queen's life. It was a poignant reminder that even the best intentions can lead to unforeseen tragedies. The tenth labor beckoned Heracles to the remote island of Erythea, where Geryon, a formidable giant, guarded a prized possession, divine red cattle. These cattle were not ordinary. Their very existence was a testament to their otherworldly nature. Heracles faced a daunting challenge even before confronting Geryon. Guarding the cattle was Orthrus, a fearsome two-headed dog, sibling to the legendary Cerberus. But Heracles, armed with his indomitable strength and trusty club, was undeterred. With a powerful swing of his club, Heracles dispatched Orthrus, clearing the path to Geryon himself. The confrontation with the giant proved to be equally intense, but Heracles, 
guided by his unwavering determination and precise aim, vanquished Geryon with a well-aimed arrow. This labor showcased Heracles' unmatched prowess and his ability to confront the most formidable adversaries. It was a testament to his indomitable spirit and unwavering commitment to completing the impossible tasks set before him. On his road to the westernmost end of the world, Heracles happened upon the chained titan, Prometheus. Upon hearing his story, Heracles shot the giant eagle which had tormented the titan for centuries and freed him from his chains. Heracles then continued his quest towards the Garden of the Hesperides. Within this mystical garden grew a tree bearing the legendary golden apples. However, guarding the tree was Ladon, a monstrous dragon, and the Hesperides themselves. The Hesperides were a group of nymphs that protected and tended to the garden. In one version of the tale, Heracles ventured alone to the garden, slaying Ladon with his legendary prowess, and retrieved the apples. However, in another tale, he sought the aid of the Titan Atlas, the father of the Hesperides. Heracles asked Atlas for his help, and in return Heracles agreed to hold up the world on his shoulders until Atlas returned with the apples. Atlas effortlessly retrieved the apples and returned to Heracles, but before handing over the apples, he had a change of heart. Atlas realized that he was free and could simply leave Heracles with the task of holding up the world. In a desperate attempt to free himself, Heracles tricked Atlas. Heracles told Atlas that he would take his place in holding up the world, but first he needed to readjust his stance. He asked Atlas to hold the world for a bit while he got in a more comfortable position. Atlas agreed, and Heracles took this opportunity to leave the Titan. On Heracles' path back to Tyrins, he encountered the giant, Antaeus. Antaeus was known to challenge strangers to a wrestling match, only to end up killing the participants. This time was no different. He challenged the mighty Heracles to a wrestling match. Antaeus proved to be a challenging opponent for Heracles, as he realized that he would not be able to defeat the giant by throwing or pinning him. Gathering his strength, Heracles grabbed hold of Anateus, lifted him off the ground and crushed him to death in a bear hug. Victorious, Heracles then took the golden apples back to Tyrans. Eurystheus, however, did not get to own them, for the goddess Athena ensured that they were returned to the garden. As Heracles faced his twelfth labor, it appeared that Eurystheus had devised a task truly insurmountable. The hero was tasked with journeying into the dreaded depths of the underworld and capturing Cerberus, the formidable guardian dog with three menacing heads. This task defied the very laws of mortality. Legends whispered that no mortal could venture into the realm of the dead and return unscathed. Cerberus, a creature of darkness and terror, guarded the threshold to the afterlife. In his quest to capture Cerberus from the underworld, Heracles stumbled upon the tragic fate of Theseus and Pirithous. The heroes had attempted to abduct Persephone and were eternally ensnared in Hades. Heracles, with his indomitable spirit, intervened to free Theseus, but was unable to free Pirithous. With Theseus free, Heracles continued his quest and sought permission from Hades, the god of the underworld, before grappling with Cerberus. In a harrowing battle of wills and strength, Heracles wrestled the beast into submission. His victory over Cerberus sent shockwaves through the realms of both the living and the dead. But Heracles, expecting a reward for his courage and triumph, was met with an unexpected twist of fate. Rather than receiving the accolades and honors he anticipated, he found himself banished from the Peloponnese, marking the end of his servitude to the king. Heracles' journey through these twelve monumental labors had transformed him into a legend, a hero whose name would echo through the annals of time, inspiring generations to come. Though the twelve labors had ended, Heracles' thirst for heroic deeds was unquenchable. He embarked on further adventures, often considered minor tasks in comparison to the monumental trials set by King Eurystheus. These lesser exploits, known as Pererga, showcased Heracles' enduring commitment to rid the world of evil, even after achieving immortality through his labors. Throughout all this, King Eurystheus' fear of Heracles did not wane with the hero's exile. He remained haunted by the legend of the indomitable demigod and his descendants, the Heraclides. These descendants bore both the blessings and burdens of Heracles' divine blood, carrying with them the legacy of their illustrious ancestor. Eurystheus, driven by paranoia 
and an insatiable thirst for power, continued to persecute the Heraclides long after Heracles. Their tale was one of exile and the relentless struggle to return to the land of Peloponnesus, from which they believed they had been unjustly banished by the king, Eurystheus. His relentless pursuit of the hero's lineage would eventually lead to his own downfall. Heracles' life wasn't confined to his celebrated labors alone. He was a tireless champion against evil, dedicating every spare moment to rid the world of malevolent forces, often defining what constituted evil himself. Heracles' journey was fraught with encounters against tyrants and giants. He vanquished Busiris, the oppressive king of Egypt, and Amathion, the ruler of Arabia. Even in the midst of his relentless adventures, Heracles briefly joined the legendary Argonauts, who sought the Golden Fleece. Though he was the natural choice for their leader, Heracles stepped aside, passing that role on to Jason. Heracles proved to be an invaluable addition to the Argonauts, but he ultimately departed the expedition due to a personal tragedy involving his beloved Hylas, who was kidnapped by nymphs. In the ancient city of Troy, years before the famous war with the Greeks, there lived an arrogant king named Laomedon. Laomedon had angered the gods Apollo and Poseidon, for they were expecting a tribute for the massive walls they had constructed for Troy, but instead the king reneged on his word. Poseidon sent a sea monster to lay waste to the land and devour anyone that got in its way. King Laomedon consulted an oracle and was instructed to feed his daughter Hesione to it. At the same time, King Laomedon offered the reward of an immortal horse to anyone that could defeat the monster. Heracles happened to be passing by the city of Troy and was enticed by this challenge. In an epic battle, Heracles allowed himself to be swallowed by the monster and killed the beast from the inside. He emerged victorious and saved Hesione from being eaten. But once a cheat, always a cheat. When Heracles went to collect his reward, King Laomedon tried to pass off an ordinary horse instead of the immortal one. Heracles, however, was not easily deceived. As with most disputes in Greek mythology, Heracles amassed a small army and engaged in war with the Trojans. It was a bloody and fierce battle where Heracles and his army killed Laomedon and all his sons except for one, Priam. Priam was the only son that counseled his father to honor the deal he made with Heracles. In the end, Heracles emerged victorious. Hesione was awarded to Telamon, brother of Peleus, uncle to Achilles, and the father of Ajax, and Heracles claimed the immortal horse. Beyond his mighty labors and legendary strength, Heracles' life was colored by a series of fateful marriages, each marked by its own trials and tribulations. In the kingdom of Ocalia, there lived a maiden of extraordinary beauty and grace, Iole, the cherished daughter of King Eurytus. Her hand in marriage was a coveted prize, but to win her heart, one had to triumph in the most challenging of contests, an archery competition. Eurytus, a master archer himself, declared that only the one who could surpass him in skill would earn the right to claim Iole. Many brave souls attempted the contest, each a skilled archer in their own right, yet none could match the prowess of King Eurytus and his sons who reigned supreme in the art of the bow. That is, until Heracles, the mighty hero, entered the fray. With unerring precision, he sent his arrows flying, piercing the heart of each target with unmatched accuracy. As Heracles basked in the glory of his victory, ready to claim Iole as his just reward, the winds of fate took a sinister turn. King Eurytus, consumed by fear, declared the contest null and void, refusing to let Heracles near his daughter. He harbored a dread that Heracles, plagued by madness before, might bring harm to Iole and any children they might bear, just as he had done with his first wife, Megara, under the cruel influence of Hera. Heracles left in anger, and soon after, he was accused of stealing horses from Eurytus. In this time of despair, Heracles found an unexpected ally in Ephytus, Eurytus's son, Iphitus believed Heracles was innocent and offered his help. Iphitus returned to Tiryns with Heracles, and there atop the palace walls the specter of madness, ever lurking in Heracles' soul, returned to haunt him. In a cruel twist of fate, he threw Iphitus to his death. The hero, burdened by the weight of his actions, was forced to serve the Lydian queen Omphale as a slave for three years. While serving her, he accomplished a series of courageous feats, 
from capturing the Secrepes to annihilating the Itones, Libya's fiercest adversaries. But despite being a slave, Heracles formed a bond with Omphali. After Heracles had served his three-year sentence, he took Omphali as his wife. It was said that 22 kings of Lydia could be traced back to Heracles and Omphali. This regal line, known as the Telonids, was named after his Lydian name. Heracles' heart was not destined to rest, and it soon found a new love in Princess Deianira, the sister of Meleager. However, their love story was marred by treachery and vengeance. As they journeyed together, they encountered the river god, Achilles, whose jealousy ignited a fierce battle for Deianira's hand. Achilles took the form of a bull and charged at Heracles. Heracles, however, grabbed hold of its horns, tearing one of them off and defeating the river god. Soon after they wed, Heracles and Deianira had to cross a river, and a centaur named Nessus offered to help Deianira across, but then attempted to violate Deianira. In a moment of rage and desperation, Heracles unleashed a deadly arrow tipped with the venomous blood of the Lernaean Hydra, ending Nessus's life. But even in death, Nessus schemed for revenge. As he lay dying, Nessus told Deianira to gather up his blood. If she ever wanted to prevent Heracles from having affairs with other women, she should apply them to his clothing. Nessus knew that his blood had become tainted by the poisonous blood of the Hydra and would burn through the skin of anyone it touched. Despite being married to Deianira, Heracles still found himself thinking of Iole. Heracles returned to Achalia, leading an army. He sacked the city and took Iole as his lover. Upon his return home, his wife Deianira asked who the beautiful woman was, to which their servant simply said, She's an Eubayan. Deianira, fearful of loosing Heracles, unknowingly became an unwitting accomplice in a tragic scheme. Suspecting her husband's affection for the beautiful Iole, she recalled what the centaur Nessus told her about his blood. She covered a shirt with the blood and told their servant to deliver it to Heracles. Little did they know that this mixture held a terrible curse. As Heracles donned the poisoned shirt, agony consumed him. The cloth seared his flesh, ripping it from his bones as he desperately tried to remove it. In agony, Heracles decided to end his misery. He built himself a funeral pyre on Mount Eta. However, nobody was willing to light the pyre. Fortunately, his friend Poyas happened to pass by, and after some convincing, finally agreed to set light to the pyre. Heracles' mortal journey met a fiery end, but his story did not conclude in death. The gods, recognizing his valor and enduring spirit, transformed him into an immortal being. In this divine metamorphosis, the mortal parts of Heracles were incinerated, leaving behind only the essence of a god. He ascended to join his divine kin on the majestic Mount Olympus. In the realm of the gods, Heracles found his ultimate love and companionship with Hebe, the goddess of youth. Their union marked the culmination of his remarkable journey, where the hero who had once walked the mortal world now dwelled among the immortals, forever celebrated for his unparalleled feats and enduring legacy. Together with Hebe, they bore two divine sons, Alexiaris and Anicetus. Their lineage was imbued with the essence of immortality. The life of Heracles, a hero of unparalleled strength and indomitable spirit, brims with tales of valor, triumph, and tragedy. He overcame insurmountable challenges, defying the gods themselves, to complete the twelve labors and secure his place among the immortals. Each labor showcased his unwavering determination and resourcefulness, earning him the admiration of mortals and deities alike. Yet Heracles was not immune to the foibles of human emotion and weakness. Love, jealousy, and the scars of past deeds haunted his path. The poisoned shirt of Nessus, a symbol of his final suffering, serves as a poignant reminder that even the mightiest can fall victim to their own desires. But there's one major event in Heracles' story that has yet to be told. It was a battle of epic proportions, one where the gods of Olympians engaged in war with the giants below. This event was known as the Gigantomachy. <laughs>